And I'm going to share my screen. The whole thing. Okay, so what are we talking about this week? We are talking about all of the introductory stuff associated with programming. We're going to talk a little bit about what programming is and what programming isn't. And we're going to talk about the first set of basic building blocks. Um, programming is about what you do with data, whether that data is me typing on the keyboard, whether that data is you playing a big programming game and you've got whatever console you have and are putting the inputs that way, that's all data. Everything that comes from external to the program into the program is data. So, all right, the flow of a program is very simple, but that simplicity can get complex. So we have input, process, and output. Um, input is anything that's external to your script or your program. When I'm typing into your game, that's input. When we get into functions, we're going to be passing information into the function. That's input. Process is what you do with the input. You can do grand things with the input. You can calculate the area of a cube with input. And output is the results of the input plus the process. And oftentimes what you're doing is you're looking when you do that process with that input to get data back. And that's what the output is. So, and this is just a very slight introduction to flowcharts. For the first two weeks, we're going to look a at a lot of flowcharts. I believe they're very helpful in visualizing what is going on with the program. Starting in about th at week three, we're going to start looking more at pseudocode. Pseudocode is something that you'll have to do later on in the class, and it is a very good way of walking through the steps of the program without having to get caught up in the language itself. Because there are really two things we're talking about in this class. We're talking about learning how to code in Python, but we're also talking about how to think like a programmer, and there's actually a very good book by that name. So we have to marry those two for you guys to be successful. So what's a variable? The variable is the first building block of Python. A variable is basically a bucket, and it's a bucket where you're going to store a piece of data. Um, the bucket has a scope, and we're going to start talking about scope in week three, but just know that it has a scope. It has a name, and it contains a value. So I have a bucket, and on that bucket, I've written a word, and in that bucket, uh, bucket I have put five rocks. So I have a variable, and that variable has a value of five. Now, it happens to be rocks. It could have been grains of sand. But... That's what a variable is. When, you are taught, when we are talking about variables, we are talking about a bucket that holds a single piece of data, at least for right now. Um, and the scope is just where it exists, because it can exist in different places. We're going to start talking about that in week three when we start talking about uh, branching. And by the way, when you look at these slides, you will see there's an associated script called variable.py and the Zybooks section. So if you're going back through this lecture and you want to follow it along in Zybooks, um, you will, that will be there. And by the way, with the video on YouTube is a very long description. That long description has links to a Google Drive that I have set up, and all of the scripts and more are on that link. So you can click that link, and you'll be able to download the script and look at the script for yourself. You can also then go back and look at Zybooks. So there are a few rules. First of all, the variable name has to start with a character. It 
the variable name is not allowed to contain spaces or special characters. You can use an underscore and that's it in a variable name. Um, you can use numbers, but you cannot use an at sign. You certainly can't use a space. So, um, define a variable. What does define a variable mean? Well, it means I am creating in Python this named space, and I'm going to put something into that space. So, I have amount equals 10. The variable name is amount. I have an assignment operator, which is a single equal sign. And in week three, you guys will understand why I keep saying single equal sign. And then on the right side, I have a value. So when you're looking at this, you know it's a variable because it is on the left hand side of a single equal sign. I'm going to be saying that for a while, but when you are reading Python, when you're looking at a Python script, you have to understand how to read it. Before you can write it, you have to understand how to read it. So amount is the name of the variable. I have a single equal sign to the right of the word amount, and to the right of that is a value. Now, it could have been any value I wanted. In this case, it's just 10. So. How does this look to Python? Well, for Python, amount is the name, and then 10 is the value. And Python stores it like this. You may say, well, that looks kind of like a table. Well, it does. So Python has a place in the memory of the computer where it's going to store every variable name and every current value. because the value of variables can change during a program and often do. So this is what defining a variable looks like from the point of view of the programmer and then, then the point of view of Python as a script. So I'm going to go out now and we're going to change and we're going to look at challenge 1.11.2. Now just a note about challenges. The challenges are not required for your grade. They, I, I encourage you to do as many as you can to get comfortable with programming. They are a great way to, to test out your understanding of individual concepts, but they do not get graded. So do what you need to do and then do what you can do. You have to have all the participation activities done and you have to have all of the labs done to get the maximum amount of grade that you can get for each module. You do not have to do the challenges. So if you're having trouble understanding a specific concept, my suggestion is to work through the challenges until you understand that concept. So I go back and forth a lot. And right now I'm going to PyCharm and I'm going to go to challenge 1.11.2. So this is PyCharm, OK? PyCharm is, this is what we want, PyCharm is an integrated development environment. And I start, even though you haven't done anything with PyCharm in the class yet, I started at week one. Next week, you have to install PyCharm and write your first program in PyCharm. So I want to get you um, used to PyCharm from the very beginning. So what is an IDE? What is an integrated development environment? An integrated development environment is an environment that makes it easier for you to code. I coded way back in the dark ages when there weren't integrated development environments. And I used a program called VI. And I would write programs in this little text editor. And then I'd read through them again and again to see if I had any errors. And then I would try and compile them. This was in my days of C and C++ coding. And then if things didn't compile, I'd go back into that little text file and I'd change it. I don't have to do that with an IDE. This IDE is going to give me a lot of information. And it's going to let me debug my code, which is huge. And I suggest everybody gets comfortable with it. So let's look at the setup. First, over here under projects, 
I have all these .py files. These .py files are Python scripts. And I have one here for every challenge, plus some other ones that I've written that I think might be helpful. And that's in my left-hand window. In my right-hand window, I have my scripts. This is just a Python script. That's all it is. Okay, and this is part of it, too. It's just um, comments. So let's run through this for a minute, and we'll figure out what's going on. First of all, up here is a comment. There is a difference between a comment and a line of code that will get executed. Comments are just there for programs to explain what they're doing. Some people I work with write paragraphs and paragraphs and have all these fancy comments. Some people don't comment at all. I'm in the middle. I think good comments are important, but I don't clutter up my code with them. And there are different ways to comment. This is just one of them with open three quotes, close three single quotes, and anything in between is a comment. My first line of executable code, what does that mean? Python is going to run through this, and it's going to try and do something on every line of code. We say, here are comments. The Python skips those. It doesn't try and do anything. The first executable line of code is line 5. And on line 5, I have defined a variable named total underscore coins. And I have set that variable equal to the value of 0. So that is line 5. I know total coins is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Now, on line 7 and 8, I have another variable called nickel count and another variable called dime count. Now, I know they're variables. They're on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Well, but what is this stuff on the right-hand side? I have int, input, with a lot of parentheses. What I am doing here is I have to have a way to allow a user to type something into a running program. That is what the input function does. The input function says, stop right here and wait till somebody types in and hits the enter key. The int here is saying, OK, I know that person was supposed to type in a number, so change that number to an integer. Because for Python, just about everything it thinks, Python thinks most things are strings. So you have to kind of tell it differently. There are two ways to tell it that it's not a string. One of them is to just not put things in quotes. Another one is to use what they call a conversion function. And a conversion function just says, take a string, make it an integer. That's what int does. So let's look a little bit about the formatting here for a second, because you're going to have to write some of this in your labs. This is a function call, OK? Input, open parenthesis, close parenthesis is a function call. I know it's a function call. Zybooks tells you it's a function call. Python provides this function. You don't have to do anything except Python just gives it to you. Input stops the processing of the program. And it waits for me to type something into a console and hit the Enter key. When I do that, I am then taking what I typed in and I'm turning it into an integer. That is common, and you'll have to do that this week. So let's take a quick look, and I'll set up my configuration in PyCharm, because I have to tell it what I want it to run. Uh, 1.2. Okay. So I have given it a configuration. That's what I did up here. Because I have to tell Python, hey, Python, I want you to run this. Now, up here, I have some icons. The arrow icon is run. It just says run the code. This little thing that looks like a bug it means debug the code. Step through the code line by line, and let me see what happens. I love the debugger. I don't work with, not all programmers I know love the debugger. I love the debugger. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to debug this program so you can watch the program work.
So I have hit the debug, and now my screen has changed a bit. I have all this stuff down here that just showed up. I have a console, and the console is where I'm going to type things in. And then I have this tab called Variable and Frames. I'm not going to worry about frames right now, but I do want to look at variables. This will show you every active variable in your program, in your script, and allow you to see what the value is and what its type is. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm up here in the code, and I have put a red dot there. And that red dot is a breakpoint. All I have to do is click near the 5, and I turn the breakpoint on, and I turn the breakpoint off. What's a breakpoint? A breakpoint is a place in the code where I have told Python to stop running, because I want to walk through. I want to see what happens on every line of code. Now, you don't do this for production code, but when I am programming and I am debugging, especially a very complex algorithm, I use the debugger all the time. So, I am going to step over line 5. Now, watch down here. This says total coins equals int 0. What does that mean? What that means is I have created from line 5 a variable called total coins. And I have set it equal, or I have assigned it to the value of 0, and 0 is an integer. That's what that little int means there. What does integer mean? Integer means I can, do, I can do arithmetic. You can't do arithmetic with strings. You can do arithmetic with integers and floats. So now I'm going to define this nickel count. And here's where I have this input and this int. So. I'm going to go back over here to the console, and I'm going to step over. So there's a couple of things you can do. Right now, be concerned with step over. We'll learn about what step in and run to and stuff is later. But for right now, you just want to use this bent arrow, and I'm going to step over. Now, you'll notice that blue line went away. That blue line was there on total coins, and then I stepped over total coins. And then it went to nickel count, and now it's not there on nickel count. What's happening? What has happened is when Python got to this input, it said, okay, I've reached the input function, so I'm stopping. And somebody has to do something. In this case, I'm the person who's debugging the program, so I have to do something, and I'm going to put in the number 10. And I'm going to hit the Enter key. Now watch line 7. Now, what you just saw on line 7 is PyCharm puts nickel count colon 10. So it says you have defined a variable nickel count, and you have put the value of 10 in it. If I go back to my variables, I now have a nickel count variable value of 10 as type integer. So that means I can do arithmetic with it. I'm going to step over line 8. Watch what happens on line 8. The line goes away. That's because Python is waiting for me to put in a value. So I'm going to put in the value 42 and hit the Enter key. So now we see that line 8 has changed. I have dime count. Its value is 42. I have dime count here. Its value is 42. They're the same dime count. This gives me an integer. So there are two different ways to look at this, but it's the same information. So now I'm going to do arithmetic. I'm going to say total coins is nickel count plus dime count. So when I step over now, notice right now my total coins has a value of 0. When I step over this line of code, total coins now has changed its value. It's gone from 0 to 52. You can see that down here under variables. You can see that up here on line 5. Because total coins was on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, anything that's on the right-hand side of that single equal sign will be placed into the area associated with total coins. And I just changed that to 52. So now I'm on line 12. On line 12 looks a little different than what we've seen. On line 12 starts out with the word print. It's an open parenthesis, 
and then I've got some stuff in here and a close parenthesis. So what does all this mean? Line 12 is output. So we had a definition. We had two lines of input. Remember, input, process, output. We had two lines of input, line 7 and line 8. I had a line of process, which was line 10. And now I'm going to output. And the output in this case is I'm just going to put something back out to the console. Okay? And what am I going to put to the console? Well, I have print. I'm going to have these words. The total is. Now, you'll notice those words are in quotes. Any string has to be in quotes. Then I've got this plus sign, and I've got this word stir and some more parentheses with total coins in the middle. Well, we know that what total coins is. Total coins is 52. What's this other stuff? Well, print is the function to output. And so what do I want to output? Well, I want to output the words the total is, colon, and a space. That space will be important. And then I'm going to add to it a string, because, and the string is going to be total coins. Because I can't add a string in an integer, or a string in a float, or a string in a Boolean. I have to convert it so they're the same kind. And you're like, well, what do you mean plus? Well, this is what they call string concatenation. All I'm doing is on line 12 is I'm taking the value of total coin, I'm telling Python to use it as a string, and I am putting the total is colon space to the left of 52. And that's what's going to print out. So if you look down here, when I step over, it says the total is 52. Now, that was a lot of me talking going through this program, but this is your first program. So I figured I ought to explain it all. Now, there's a couple other things to notice in here. The big thing is parentheses. When you are calling a function, and by the way, print, input, and int, and stir are all functions. And they are functions that Python gives you just because you're using Python. You don't have to do anything special. Um, and those parentheses have to be balanced. For every opening left parenthesis, you have to have a closing right parenthesis. So in the case of line 7, I have int, and then I have an open and closing parenthesis associated with int. Inside of that, I have the word input, which is a function name, and then I have the open and closed parenthesis. So my parentheses are balanced. I have the same number of opening parentheses as I do closing parentheses. Now, let's take a look for one quick second about what would happen if I didn't. Okay, I'm going to break this code for a minute. And what I want you to do is look over here. Because right now we don't have any red over here. But I'm about to remove one parenthesis, and we start to get red. And it's not just where I remove the parenthesis. It's all over the place. Now what happens if I run this? Let's just run it. So I just tried to run it, and something that just ran fine, all of a sudden won't. I have this wonderful little error down here, and it's basically telling me that on line 8, dime count, syntax error, invalid syntax. Now, to most people, this makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense because... Line 8 is fine. I didn't change a thing on line 8. I only changed something on line 7. And that's because people, programmers write error messages, and they try and tell you as soon as they find out something. But we didn't find it out till line 8. So that's why it's not telling you exactly where the problem is. The problem is that I no longer have balanced parentheses. PyCharm, if you try and run it, will give you this error, but you'll also see these wonderful red squiggly lines. When you see the red squiggly lines, it is because you have a syntax error. Something is wrong. In my case, the something is wrong is I don't have balanced parentheses. I have one opening left parenthesis, another opening left parenthesis, one right parenthesis, and then the next right parenthesis that Python sees is here. So it's trying to figure out what's happened. Well, what's happened is I left off a parenthesis. So to correct this, 
I add the parenthesis and the whole thing works again. So, and by the way, I do try and keep these to an hour, but sometimes it takes longer. So I'm going to try and keep it to an hour. Okay. So using a variable. Okay, so we just looked at this. I think I said everything I wanted to. Uh, let's just double check. All right, so that's a variable name. That's variable name. Variable name. Yeah, I think I said all this already. We'll just click through it quick. Okay. And then we got all these assignment operators. I'll just go through this quickly. All of the variables have assignment operators. I'm going to then use the, vari the values in the variables and I'm going to print total coins. So that's the relationship. Okay, so you'll notice I talked about string and integer and things like that in the slide and specifically in the PyCharm program. Well, what are these? Every variable has a type. Now, there are languages like C and C++ and Java, which are called strongly typed language. And that means you have to define the type of a variable before you use it. So if I'm going to, if total coins is going to be an integer, I have to tell Java that it's an int, that it is an integer before I ever use it, or Java will give me an error. I don't have to do that in Python. Python will simply say, oh, that's an int that it's on the right-hand side. So the type of this variable will be an int. It's a much more loosely typed language. There are four basic types in Python for variables. There's a string, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, which is an ordered collection of letters. There's an integer, which is just a whole number. There is a float, which is a number with a decimal point, and there's a Boolean, which we will talk about in Module 3. Module 3 will be all about Boolean. So those are what a variable, those are the types of variables. Okay, so a string is myster equal Lisa. Now, myster is a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I know that my that the, the variable on the right hand side is a string because it's in quotes. You can't just type the word Lisa and have Python accept it as a string. You have to put a string in quotes. And then I have a float that's just 3.14. So a quick foray into functions. We don't write functions until module five. But Python provides us a whole, a whole host of functions. I'll show you python.org. There are more functions than I can even remember. Um, and the functions have a specific format. So you have a function name, an open parenthesis, and a closing parenthesis. And you might have things that go inside those parentheses. But that's the basic format for a function. Now, if we're not going to write functions until week five, why do we need to know about functions in week one? Because we're going to use functions. You're going to use the print function in your lab. You're going to use the input function in your lab. You're going to be converting variables, strings to integers, integers to strings, floats. You're going to be converting. You're going to be using different types. So that's why we talk about it now. You have to understand what a function is, how it differs from a variable. So we're going to convert types. I just talked about that. And basically what we're doing is we're changing one type to another. So we can convert a string to an integer by using the int function, open and close parenthesis, with a value or a variable. In this case, I'm using the variable of myster. Myster has the string 42, which is in quotes. And what will happen? Well, CONV will become equal to the number 42, which doesn't have any quotes. All right. So I have string to float. Myster has a value of 3.14, but it is a string because it is in quotes. 
I'm going to convert it. I'm going to say float, just like we have the int function, we have the float function. Opening and closing parentheses, and in between it is my variable myster, which is going to be converted to the number 3.14. Now I can convert an integer or a float to a string. And it will have quotes. Now this becomes important when you are doing your output. Because in your output, you're going to have to have a string and then potentially an integer to get the output right for the Zybooks labs. Um, and Zybooks is picky. Zybooks wants you to have spaces and cases correct. And it wants to make sure everything's properly converted. So be careful of that when you are using um, when you're using the print function. And we'll do a little bit more of that in a bit. OK, so I showed you input, and now we're going to talk about input and output. Input is the process of me typing in 10 or 42. It's getting data that I, as the user, want into my running program so it can do something with it. Output is the computer communicating back to me at least for this class. It's communicating something back to me. How do we do that? We do it with the print function. Now, input has a pretty specific format. You have the word input. You can ha either have nothing inside the parentheses, or you can have a string inside the parentheses. Those are the only two options. We saw in the PyCharm example that we had an input inside of, sorry, we had an input with only with nothing inside the parentheses. That's fine. It's acceptable. That will work for your Zybook activities. When you start working on your game, you're going to have to put something inside that input, and it will be a string. So print is a way we give information back to the person who's running the program. And in this case, there are a couple of different formats. And we're actually going to get into format specifiers next week. But for right now, we are going to, um, you can have print with a single string in the middle of it. Or you can have print with a single string and then a comma, because we're giving it two pieces of information instead of one. And I can have an end which equals a character or a value. Now, why is that important? Well, usually when you use the print, it's going to always end with a new line. But I don't always want it to end with a new line. And this is important for one of your labs this week. So I'm going to tell it to end with something different. Maybe I've, I'm going to have it print out a bunch of different things, but I want those different things to be printed out without a new line in between them. I want it to be printed out with a space in between them. So that's what that end equal. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a little bit more about functions. The stuff inside the parentheses are called arguments. So I'm passing in an argument to a function. Or I'm passing in two arguments to a function. Um, so, how to call the input function. So first of all, we have Professor Leisha, and she's sitting there in front of her computer testing students' code. And I am using challenge 3.14, 3.4, sorry, 1.3.4, and it says, read two numbers from user input, then print the sum of those numbers. So, I'm going to have my little flow chart here on the side, which is going to be input process and output. And right now the input is num1 equals int input. It says a few things. I'm going to be expecting a user to type something in on their keyboard. That key, that what they're typing is expected to be an integer. And I'm going to assign whatever happens from that to the variable num1. I know num1 is a variable because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. So num1 is a variable name. I got my functions. I've got my parentheses. All my parentheses are balanced. 
So I have my open in parentheses and my closed parentheses, and Professor Lisa is going to type in the number 2. So num1 is now going to have the value of 2. And this is all what this is, that line is all about input. So I'm now going to have num2 equals int input. We just looked at all of that. Now I'm going to input 4. And so num2 is going to contain the value of 4. That's another input. So the next thing I do is process. Process is print num1 plus num2. So I'm going to say num1 has got the value of 2, num2 has the value of 4, and 2 plus 4 is 6, and I'm going to print that out. So that part is the process. And then the output is me printing the number 6 to the screen. So that's how it that's how the, this this code marries up to that thing input process output and when you're programming you want to remember what is what because that's what you're going to do and by the way those little starts and ends are just the things that you need for your flowcharts okay rule you can call one function inside of another which we just figured out with int and input for every open Parenthesis, you must have a closing parenthesis, and you'll probably hear me sound like a broken record on that one too. Print can use string, integer, float, or Boolean variables. However, if a string, however, if a string is a string, then all integers, floats, and booleans must be converted to a string. Don't know why it said if a string is a string. So how to call the print function? Okay. So we have challenge 1.3.2, and it says write a simple statement that prints the following, 3, 2, 1, go. You can call this as a single argument. That's all you have to do. Right there, that can be a whole program. That's it. We have a function name. We have an open, opening parenthesis. We have our argument. In this case, it's a string with quotes, 3, 2, 1, go. And we have our closing parenthesis. And that's what we have. And it can be that simple. We can look at challenge 1.3.2 over here in PyCharm. 1.3.2. Um, oh, I added some extra stuff. My bad. Never mind. I don't know why that's 1.3.2. I must have been doing that, changing that for another class, or for when I was talking like last time. Um, let's keep going. Okay, so this is with a single argument. We'll get there in just a second. Okay. Now, you call the print function with two arguments. And what does that do? Well, what that does is it allows you to concatenate those two different print functions. Well, why couldn't I just say line one and then continued? Well, in this case you could, but you don't want to because, well, in this case you can, but starting in week three, you're going to start doing branching and you may not know what you're going to put after that. So in this case, we have the print function. I have the first argument, I have a comma, you always have to have a comma between arguments, and then I have argument two. Now this is a special argument, it's end, equal, and then whatever I want it to end with. End, by the way, is a variable that will be private to the print function, and I am telling it what I want it to, do, to be, and in this case I want it to be a space. And then I will print line one, Now the space is going to go next to that, and then the word continued. So that's how the print function works. I'm going to sound like a broken record. For every open parenthesis, you have to have a closing parenthesis. Print, if you don't tell it otherwise, print is going to end in a new line, which means it's just like you hit the enter key. And the end argument tells it to print a space 
instead of a new line. And that could have been anything inside the quotes. It didn't have to be a space. Okay, so the secret life of Python script. Where follow program calculates yearly and monthly salaries given an hourly wage. The program assumes a work um, hours per week of 40 and a work week of year of 50s. Now, so I have a variable called hourly wage. I know it's a variable because it's on the left hand side of single equal sign. I am expecting the value to be an integer and I am going to allow the user to type in because I have input inside of an int function. So your handy dandy teacher, she put in the number 20. So hourly wage is going to be 20. The process is Yearly equals hourly times 40 times 50. I have to format that better. So it's going to be 20 times 40 times 50, which is going to be 40,000. Monthly equals hourly times 40 times 4, and hourly is still 20. So that's going to be 3,200. And then I'm going to output that. And the output is going to be annual salary is I'm going to print yearly, and then it's going to say monthly salary is, and then I'm going to print monthly. So that is the secret life of the Python script, input, process, output. And you can have as many lines for process as you need. You can have as many input lines as you need. You can have as many output lines as you need. There's no limit on them except the size of the RAM that you have to run the thing. And then we end it. So statements and expression, what's the difference? A statement basically is um, when you are setting a variable. So in this case, we're going to have input, please enter an integer, and another input statement. And we have x, which is a variable because it's, we know it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And y is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And then we're going to have an expression. And the expression is our process. So area equals int of x times int of y is our process. And that's an expression. It's going to modify the data. It's going to do something. And then output is another statement. So input and output are considered statements. You're just calling a function. You're setting a variable. Um, and an expression modifies the variable. It does something. Um, and as a programmer, I don't talk in expressions and statements. I talk in lines of code. Zybooks thought this was important. I, will, I felt it was important to let you visually see what the difference between a statement and an expression is. And we have our end as well. So cases and spaces matter. Python is a case-sensitive and space-delimited language. What does that mean? Well, I have x equal 2. We know x is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And now I have capital X equal to, and those two are not the same. Lowercase x is not the same as uppercase x, and that's because they're a different case. Behind all of this, there's something called the ASCII table. And every number has a, um, sorry, every number Every letter and number have an associated number. And little x has a different number than big X, so they're different. Okay, that's lowercase, that's uppercase. Space limited means that um, you have, um, sorry, space limited means that Spaces matter. So you can, if you, if you don't have things lined up to the left-hand side, you're going to have a problem. So that is correct. This is not correct. 
So y is x equal 2 and y equal 4 on different lines correct, and x equal 2 and y equal 4 on the same line not correct. That's because on our correct example, Python knows where to stop reading a statement or an expression because it comes to a new line. It does not know when to stop reading or that and that two expressions are different if they are on the same line because Python looks for that new line that, you know, when we hit the enter key, Python stores that when, we're, when it's reading through the script. It says, wait a minute, I don't see an enter key and there's a problem because there are two single equal signs in the same line of code, so I'm going to throw up my hands and tell you it's an error. So that's why cases and spaces matter because that's what Python knows. Okay, the ASCII table. Every character has an, a numerical equivalent. And a character is not always a visible character. So, for example, a space has the numeric representation of 32, and it, the Python representation is the space in between two quotes. A tab, you can't see a tab. Python's representation is a slash T, or backslash T. And its numeric representation is 9. And just like a new line, backslash n, its numeric representation is 10. So if, hold on, if I go here really quick and I say, I right, look at the ASCII table. This makes it a little clearer. So what we see here is this very tiny little table. Come on. All right, it's not making it bigger for me on my Mac for some reason. There we go. You will see a decimal. Those decimals are all just integers. You will see hex. Don't worry about it. You'll see octal. Don't worry about it. You'll see the character. Null is zero all the way up to the delete key, which is 127. And there are all these things that you can't see. You know, you have a bell. You could put seven in your code and and have a bell turn on. You have a carriage return, which is um, different than a new line. You have an escape sequence. You don't start to actually see a visible character until you get to number 32. All of 0 through 31 are invisible. You cannot actually see them. Starting with 32, you have a space. Then we have all of our special characters, then we have our numbers and some more characters. We don't even get to our first um, alphabet letter until we get to number 65. And that's a capital A. Now this table is, I kind of like this table because we can also go right across and see that number 97 is a lowercase a. 66 is an uppercase b. 98 is a lowercase b. That's why state, that's why cases matter in Python because Python underneath the hood sees an x, a lowercase x, which is 120, and says, okay, a lowercase x is 120. That's the right number. But it, then it sees an uppercase x as 88. So they're different to Python. So that is why it's important to remember in Python that case sensitivity is, matters because it can be one of the most frustrating things if all of a sudden you're trying to um, you're trying you're trying to write a line of code and you're using lowercase x and uppercase x and you really should only be using lowercase x and we'll see an example of that in just a minute. So, now that we saw that ASCII table and we looked at tab and new line, there are some um, special characters. The backslash is a special character. And the backslash basically tells you that how to use some of the unseen characters. We don't see a tab. We just realize that our cursor is, is tabbed in, you know. Um, so, 
and we don't see a new line. We hit the enter key and we go to the next line. But there is actually a character there that we, it's not a visible character that we don't see, that will put something on a new line. And here's some example code to do that, okay? Um, and you have to remember, if you have backslashes in strings, you have actually have to backslash the backslashes. So they come out as backslashes. Is that a tongue twister? So what do I mean by that? When you have a string in Python and you use the backslash character, Python is automatically going to assume that you're going to put a, um, a, an escape character next to it and you're going to have a tab or a new line. If you just want to have backslash as a character in a string, you have to put two of them because backslash will escape the first backslash. So if you have problems and you're in my class and you're trying to do something like this, um, email me and I'll help you. Um, a single quote is spectacular, but if I am using single quotes on the outside of a string because I can use two single quotes or two double quotes. So if I have a string with two single quotes and I want to use a single quote inside that string, I have to escape it. I have to tell Python, hey, wait a minute. This quote here isn't really supposed to end my string. It is just supposed to show up inside the string. Um, and I have the same with double quotes, because a string can be double quoted. Um, so you have, to, you have to escape the string if it's in double quotes. And I can add a new line. Maybe I've got this long string, and I say my name is blah, 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 and then I'm going to say a new line is John. And then, excuse me, I apologize. Tabs will tab in. So arithmetic operators, um, pretty much like you've seen in math except for the exponent operator. So addition is a plus, subtraction is a minus, multiplication is a star, division is the slash, and exponent is star star. So those are our arithmetic, our arithmetic operators. The only one that works on a non-integer or a non-float is the plus sign. You can concatenate two strings together with plus sign. Okay, lab 1.9. Um, let's see, what time is it? Sorry, what time is it? I want to see if I should do another example. Now we'll go through these, and then if you have questions, let me know, and I can do some examples. So, Lab 1.9, this is just an overview. I'm going to go through the process of what you're going to have to write. So basically, I'm going to show you a flow chart. All right, so complete the program. Read four values from input and store the values in variable first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. So I have four variables. So I'm going to have four lines of code. And on that line of code, I'm going to have the variable name, I'm going to have a single equal sign, and then I'm going to have something to the right of the single equal sign. And what is going to be to the right of that single equal sign is going to be an input for these four variables. And then it's going to use it to output a short story. So when you're doing a flow chart, you always have a little start bubble. And then I'm going to input first name, and I'm going to input generic location, and I'm going to input whole number, I'm going to input plural noun. And then I'm going to output, and then I'm going to end. So when I'm looking at a flowchart or pseudocode, I'm not actually writing code at that point. Flowcharts are very good for the process of a, um, of a, program without having to worry about the syntax. So if you want to look at, I'm going to say input first name, well, first underscore name is the variable name, and input is what I'm going to do. So lab 1.10, it says a variable like username can store a value like an integer. 
Extend the given program as indicated. Output the user's input. Output the input squared and cubed. And get a second user input. Uh, set, sorry, get a second user input into the user underscore num2, that's going to be a variable, and output the sum and the product. So here I just have a few little bubbles. When it says output, you're using the print function. When it says input, you're using the input function. So I have my little start bubble, and then what am I going to do? I'm going to input user num, and then I'm going to convert user num to an integer because I have to do some calculations with it. And then I'm going to square user num, and I'm going to output the squared user num, and oh, my arrow came out in the wrong place. And then I'm going to cube user num, and I'm going to output cubed user num. And then I'm going to go down, and I'm going to input my second number. I'm going to convert it to an integer. I'm going to sum user num. 1 and user num 2. I'm going to output the sum. I'm going to multiply it. I'm going to output the product and I'm going to end. Now when we see this and we're looking at this, you might be able to combine some steps, but at a minimum you need to go when you're looking at this, you need to go and you need to get familiar with input you need to figure out how to do that conversion with the int function. You need to have, know how to square with arithmetic. You need to know how to use the print function to output the right stuff, because iBooks is going to tell you how it wants it output. So that's what this is. So you've got input, process, output, and they, several things happen in this program that are input, process, and output. So lab 1.21. Write a program using integers, user num, and x as input, and I'll put the user num divided by x three times. So we have the word output, which is going to tell you you want to use the print function. We're going to, it says write a programming using integers, user num, as input. So we're going to use the input function for both of those variables. So I've got a start, I'm going to input user num, I'm going to input x, I'm going to convert user num to an integer because if I use the input function everything is a string, I'm going to convert x to an integer, I'm going to divide user num by x, I'm going to out, I'm going to print out the, um, I'm going to print out user num divided by x. I'm going to say, I'm going to do it a second time, so I'm going to say my variable div2 is div divided by x, I'm going to output div2, and I'm going to do it a third time, and I'm going to output div3, and then I'm going to end. Okay, write a program using inputs age, weight, heart rate, and time respectively, and output the average calories burned for a person. Output each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved by the following print statement. So type in that print statement identically if they already don't have it for you in the Zybooks lab, because that's pretty much the only way you're going to get that print statement right. We haven't talked about format specifiers yet. So. We're going to use the input function for each variable, and when we output, we're using the print function. I know I sound like a broken record, but I think it's important to stress when we're going through these labs that you're taking a word problem and you're turning it into code. So there are clues, and these are some of the clues. So we're going to input age. We're going to input weight. We're going to input heart rate. We're going to input time. We're going to convert age to an integer. We're going to convert weight to an integer. We're going to convert heart rate to an integer. Time to an integer. You get the pattern. And then we're going to calculate the calories. The calculation is provided in the script. We're going to output that. 
and then we're going to end. So 2.123 is a bit longer and we're going to prompt the user to input an integer between 32 and 26, a float, a character, and a string, and then we're going to output the four variables on a single line separated by a space. Um, we're going to do it in reverse and we're going to convert the integer to a care using the care function. So we're going to start, we're going to do int user, we're going to input all of our lovely little values. We're going to output everything in a row, so we're going to use a print statement to do that. We're going to output everything in the reverse order to what we put it in. We're going to convert user int to character using the care function and we're going to output that character and then we're going to end. Now at the bottom of this slide I have a reference to the Python documentation or sorry to W3 schools which gives some really good example on using the care function. And that's it. That's it for the lecture. Um, I know that it's a little after 10. I didn't know if you guys wanted me to go through any more of the scripts or if anyone has any questions. Feel free. Okay, good. How can you access the recorded videos? Let me show you. Okay. And that's me. So if I go to my channel, I will paste this into um, I'll paste this into the chat. And this is the channel. The channel is just me. And these are all the videos. I have videos from like the last two years worth of lectures up. And so if you look at this, like this is module 7, 22 EW5. Um, and then I have playlists for like for the last two years, I have module 1 coding. So there's like four or five videos. Same with module 2, module 3. Sometimes I go over things more in depth. Sometimes students ask questions. So there are playlists. There are individual videos. Um, and I will paste this right now. Okay, so there is my channel on YouTube. And if you go, I'll just show you while I'm thinking about it. If you go into any of these videos, let's just say we. I've five, been getting paid a thousand dollars. Here. Um, and you go down and you look at the description. Uh, wait a minute. The description should be here. Why isn't it there? Okay. So when you go and you look at the description, what you'll see here is all these Python scripts. So this is just for, for um, module six. So I have all the challenges and I have some additional scripts that I wrote that we went over in the class. And then the pseudocode is up there, or in this case, the um, images of the flowcharts will be up there. So that's what you'll see in all of the different videos. Some of these will be longer, some of these will be shorter. But if I click on this, it takes you to the code and you can download that code. Um, and that's there for all of the modules. I have all of the challenges and any additional code. There is also, as we get closer to the projects, I will, um, we will go over some of that. And if I write code associated with that, or if we go over code associated with that, it will always be in the description. So, does anybody have any more questions? Not a problem. So, I will say, how do? I'm not, I don't understand, Mandy. 
how do we access the recording? So all you have to do is go to the video. This will be up tomorrow. That's fine. I type too fast all the time, too. Um, all you do is go to the YouTube channel. This video will be up tomorrow, probably. I don't know if I'll get it up around noon or later in the evening, but I generally try and have them up with all of the coding examples sometime on Friday. So that's, that's when you will look at them. By the way, just to let you know, for anybody who's going to be returning next week, I won't be doing this next week. I unfortunately have a family funeral that I need to go to, and I will be out of town on Thursday. However, there are Module 2s. So if I go back, thank you very much, Mandy. I appreciate it. So if I go back here and you look at these playlists, uh, there's four, five, six, seven. There's more than that. Okay. And um, um, I'm going yeah, to yeah, share my screen. I'm um, just a little bit. So I can say five, module one. So these are all the module one recordings. And I'll put the, the um, oops, playlist. Module two recording, module two session recording. So here on the playlist, you I see all 21 um, for just module two. And so this gives you everything. Screen. So there are multiples for you to look at. Um, and then there on, is all of, why is that there? I will take a look uh, and figure out okay. why we don't have all the challenges there. And then you get to listen to me go, um, while I put up the video. Um, so I say, um, again, but look at, my suggestion is to look so at this even though welcome. it's long, because I believe this later one has, yeah, this has all of the challenges and the additional stuff that we need, that, that I did on that one. So some of the early ones don't have um, some of the earlier ones don't have all of the challenges with them but the later ones do I'm glad that that helped you Mandy um, are there any other questions and by the way if you do if you just want to talk you can open up the mics at this point Oh, thank you, Michaela. Um, what do you mean, Rahman, I, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name right, by intermediate level or advanced? Hey, uh, I'm Lisa, sorry. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, by, uh, by the end of this class, are we, um, in terms of uh, Python, like, are we going to be able to code on the advanced level or is it going to be like more of the intermediate kind of level of coding? I, I'm pretty sure that you're still going to be a beginner. When we get done with this class, we will have given you the foundation to code in Python. Python is a vast language with a vaster user community. There are so many things that you can do with Python and we only scratch the surface of these eight weeks. So if um, we're going to, to try and teach you the syntax, but also the concepts that you can take forward. So when we get done with this class, I don't think the students are at an intermediate level. I think the students are still at a beginner level, and that's partly because of experience. Python has so many options and usages um, that it's very difficult after eight weeks to say that somebody's going to be an intermediate or advanced level if you haven't had an opportunity to actually program. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, so the advancement beyond the course, um, 
Advance would be on this course dependent on our intended use of language sometimes. Michaela, um, so some people want to do game programming in Python. And I would suggest that they look at a module called Pygame and go out and give it a try. So if, if you're going to be in cybersecurity, then your use of Python is going to be different than if you're writing a game. You're probably going to want to write some custom tools to do, um, you know, to, to go out there and, and, you know, parse penetration testing results and things like that. You know, if you're going to go work at the company Pinterest, you're probably going to need to know a lot about how to um, control your UI with Python and maybe with Django, which is a Python framework for web. So, um, so we provide you the basics, and then your next step is decide what or how you want to use it. Maybe you don't want to use Python at all. Maybe you want to go into game programming. Maybe you, you know, just want to, you know, dip your feet in the water here and there. There's also a way to do that. You can find projects, Python projects on GitHub that are always looking for newbies to test and then maybe eventually help write the code. So that is, um, so there, there are so many ways to do things. If you're looking to use it in marine biology. Um, well, let's go look. Anybody who doesn't want to stay is fine. I'm not going to worry about it, but um, let's go look. Python Marine Biology. Ocean Python, Python tools for oceanography and marine biology. So here are modules that somebody has already written that you can use to deal with oceanographic or, um, yeah, oceanographic data. And what, um, you'll want to do is go and look at these projects. Does that help? Not a problem. You got, you have a very nice evening. Um, unless anybody has any questions, I'm going to call the lecture and stop the recording. And